Stanford University.
しますこんにちは。Celebrating the magnificent pluralism that this university has come to embody. Our speaker today is Christian. We began with a Buddhist call to prayer. And you also hear readings from the Native American, Muslim, Jewish, and Christian sources. Talisman will sing spiritual songs from Africa and the African diaspora, and Tycho's drumming blessing has Japanese roots. The Menlo Brass Quintet's music is from the Western European canon. This should feel like a festival of and for the world. We're honored to have Sister Joan Chittister here today to deliver the baccalaureate address. She's a Roman Catholic nun, formerly the prioress of the Benedictine Sisters of Erie, Pennsylvania. She's a prolific author, having written over 45 books. And she served as the president of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, an organization of the superiors and leaders of over 67,000 Catholic women in the United States. Our student reflection will be given by Tara Gu, who will graduate tomorrow with a major in public policy and in human biology as a minor. She's been a resident assistant on campus at Crothers. And also studied at the Bing, Stanford, and Washington program and abroad in Cape Town, South Africa. Congratulations to each of you who will graduate tomorrow. Congratulations to your family members and friends. You should also note, though, that there are two students listed in your program notes who won't ever be able to take part in graduation activities. They died during this last academic year. And the flowers on the dais are in the memory of Sarah Jane Adikoff, member of the class of 2012, and PhD candidate Abnander Litt. Life is so precious and in so many ways so fragile. In the midst of this celebration today, we do well to honor these two students and to give thanks for their unique contributions to the world during their short but full lives. So please join me now in a moment of silence. So that we can reflect on their time with us and on their passing. Amen. Please join me now in the invocations. Then I was standing on the highest mountain of them all. And around me was the whole hoop of the world. And while I stood there, I saw more than I can tell, and I understood more than I saw. For I was seeing in the sacred manner the shape of all things of the Spirit, and the shapes as they must live together like one being. And I saw that the sacred hoop of my people was one of many hoops that make one circle. Wide as daylight and starlight. And in the center grew one mighty flowering tree to shelter all the children of one mother and one father. And I saw that it was holy. Above all, Trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We should like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. 
And yet, it is the law of all progress that it is made by passing through some stages of instability, and that it may take a very long time. And so I think it is with you. Your ideas mature gradually. Let them grow. Let them shape themselves without undue haste. Don't try to force them on, as though you could be today what time, that is to say, grace and circumstances acting on your own goodwill, will make you tomorrow. Only God could say what this new spirit gradually forming within you will be. Give our Lord the benefit of believing that his hand is leading you and accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. I have learned so much from God that I can no longer call myself a Christian, a Hindu, a Muslim, a Buddhist, or a Jew. The truth has shared so much of itself with me that I can no longer call myself a man, a woman, an angel, or even a pure soul. Love has befriended me so completely it has turned to ash and freed me of every concept and image my mind has ever known. Sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. I am sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. You used to rock. Sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. Since you've gone and left me, there's been so little beauty, but I know I saw it clearly through your eyes. Now the
All right, here's the important message. Congratulations, class of 2012. I came across, I came across the country to give you a news flash. It's a short message, it's this. You're very important. You're important to the rest of the country and you're important to this world. No matter what the newspapers say, we are waiting for you. We need you badly. And the question is not why. You know why. The question is only how will you respond to the rest of this world as a follower or as a leader? And if as a leader, if that is your aspiration already, then what kind of a leader will you be? Bertolt Brecht, a German dramatist, wrote that there are many elements to a campaign. Leadership is number one. Everything else, he said, is number two. And Walter Lippmann said the final test of a leader is someone who leaves behind themselves in another year, in other graduates, the conviction and the will to carry on what they began. But how do we know what it really means to be a leader and how do we know who should do it? There are clues to those answers in folk literature, I think. The first story that we tell back home about leadership is this one. It's about two boats that meet head on in a shipping channel at night. And as boats are wont to do in the dark, boat number one flashed, boat number two, we are on a collision course. Turn your boat 10 degrees north. Boat two signaled back, yes we are on a collision course. Turn your boat 10 degrees south. Boat number one signaled again, I am an admiral in Her Majesty's Navy. And I am telling you to turn your boat 10 degrees north. Boat number two flashed back a little stronger this time. And I am a seaman second class. And I am telling you to turn your boat 10 degrees south. By this time, the admiral was furious. He flashed back one last time. I repeat, I am an admiral in Her Majesty's Navy, and I am commanding you to turn your boat 10 degrees north. I am in a battleship. And the second boat returned a signal that said, and I am commanding you, sir, to turn your boat 10 degrees south. I am in a lighthouse. <laughs> Point. Rank, titles, and positions. Put them down right now. They are no substitute for leadership. You are all graduating from this great university this weekend because someone saw leadership potential in you at a time of grinding poverty and gross inequality, boy, child, soldiers, and girl, child, trafficking. At a time when we have never needed leadership more, someone sees in you today the possibility to become a powerful presence in the public arenas of our own times. The question is then, what will you inspire as you leave this world for that world? The motto under which you have been educated here, the wind of freedom blows, is exactly what a world struggling between the challenges of the present and the norms and ideals of the past requires. It requires the freedom to question and the freedom to rethink absolutes. It requires the freedom to confront what does not work, is not working, will never work, and to rebel against rigidities that mask as unassailable traditions. It requires you to re-energize the kind of courageous initiative that opened the frontier in one century and went to the moon in the next. It requires the kind of vision that freed slaves 
and empowered women that preserved the spiritual but honored the secular as well. What the world needs now are those of you who will commit yourselves to free that kind of energy everywhere and lead others to do the same. First, however, you have to realize that the world did not send you here simply to get itself one more engineer or business manager. No, the world sent you here to become its leaders. But note well, the world you have been given to lead is both glorious and grim. One right step and the whole world can become new again. One more wrong step and the globe itself is in irreversible danger. Indeed, we need a new direction. Indeed, we ourselves need a new point of view. We need a more complete human agenda. No, the world does not really need the skills you learned here. Today's skills will all change anyway in the next five years. And the world does not need answers either. Answers are easy to come by. You Google them. <laughs> what the world really needs from you now is the courage to ask the right questions without apology, without fear, without closed-mindedness, and without end. It needs those who will lead from the vantage point of new questions, not old answers, from the perspective of global needs, not simply parochial interests. Why? Because as we sit here today, all of you in glorious gowns and, and the caps of achievement, two-thirds of the hungry of this world are women. That's why. Two-thirds of the illiterate of this world are women. Two-thirds of the poorest in this world are women. That cannot be an accident. That has to be policy. Clearly, someone somewhere has decided that women need less, want less, deserve less. Where are the leaders who will change these things? Are they sitting us in front of us today or not? The ozone layer, the placenta, The ozone layer, the placenta of the earth, has been ruptured. The polar ice cap is melting and raising water levels of, of islands in the Pacific. And at the same time, the lands of the poor are turning to dust and stone, while the industrialized world goes on choosing short-term profits over long-term global warming treaties. Nuclear weaponry threatens the very existence of the planet, and they have the affrontery to call it defense. Where are the leaders who will change these things? Are they sitting here before me this afternoon? The question is then, how shall you lead this next generation so that the errors of this present generation do not simply become even more death-dealing in the future than they are now? If you really want to be leaders who will lead this country and this world down a different path, there are three stories you should know, I think. They may say more about the kind of leadership needed for our time than anything any MBA leadership manual can ever begin to explain to you. The first is from the Western fabulist Hans Christian Andersen. You may have even learned this one as a child but you must remember that, in fact, it is about a very adult problem. In this story, a village is preparing for a visit from its king. He will come regally dressed, they're told. Never, they say, has any king been so finely arrayed as ours. So on the day of the king's arrival, people cheer and cheer as the king strides by shouting, you, O oh king, are the finest king of all. Except for one child, one small child, looks at what he's seen and shouts, no, no. The 
this king is not splendid. This king is not being honest. In fact, he says, this king has no clothes on at all. And then the whole crowd went silent. Then finally, the farce was over. Then everyone snuck away ashamed of what they had allowed to go unchallenged. Only then did the dishonest emperor resign the throne. Point. If you really want to be a leader, you must be a truth teller. If you want to save the age, the Irish poet Brendan Connelly writes, betray it. Expose its conceits, its foibles, its phony moral certitudes. Remember that there will be those among the powerful who will try to make you say what you know is clearly not true. Because if everyone agrees to believe the lie, that lie can go on forever. The lie that there is nothing we can do about discrimination, nothing we can do about world poverty, nothing we can do about fair trade, nothing we can do to end global carnage, nothing we can do in this country to provide education and health care, housing and food, maternity care and just wages for everyone in the world. Nothing we can do about those women. <laughs> Nothing we can do about those women who, as you and I, look in one another's eyes right now, are someplace, somewhere, in great global numbers, being raped, beaten, trafficked, silenced, yet, still, now, here, everywhere. If you want to be a leader, you too must refuse to tell the old lies. You must learn to see what you're looking at and say what you see. The second story is about the Buddhist monk Tetsugan who determined to translate the Buddhist scriptures into Japanese. He spent years begging for the money it would take to have the blocks made for the printing. But just as he was about to begin the first printing, a great flood came and left thousands homeless. So Tetsugan took the money he'd spent years raising in order to publish the scriptures, and he built houses for the homeless instead. And then he began again to beg the money he needed to print the sacred books. This time, just as he was almost finished, Collecting funds for the task, a great famine came. And this time, Tetsugan took the money for the translation work and fed thousands of the starving. Then when the hungry had been fed, he began collecting his money for the third long time. When the scriptures were finally printed in Japanese, they were enshrined for all to see but they will tell you to this day in Japan that when parents take their children to view the books, they tell them that the first two editions of those scriptures, the new houses and the thriving people, were even more beautiful than the printed edition of the third. The second lesson of leadership then is that no personal passion no private agenda, not even any religious ritual must ever be allowed to come between you and the people you serve. The third lesson of leadership comes from the Sufi master who taught disciples one thing only. If you want to smell sweet, stay close to the seller of perfumes. That dimension of leadership development is clear, too. It says, the heroes you make for yourselves now, the people you idolize, whose values and behavior you follow now, will be the measure and essence of your own character and the legacy you yourself leave 
If you want to lead the world to compassion, then you must surround yourself with the compassionate rather than the uncaring. If you want to lead the world to wholeness, you must follow the peacemakers, not the warmongers. If you want to lead the world to the freedom you learned here, equality for everyone must mean more to you than domination by anyone. Justice must mean more to you than money. People must mean more to you than fame. Ideals must mean more to you than power or politics or public approval. If you really want to inspire those you leave behind with the conviction and the will to go on after you, doing good, doing justice, doing right, like the child in the village, like the wise old monk, Tetsugan, like the Sufi saint of perfume sellers, always choose reality over image. Choose people over personal profits and projects and choose your own heroes wisely. Speak up loud and clear to the powers of this world who are using power for themselves alone. The great leaders of history are always those who refuse to bend to naked kings. Mahatma Gandhi, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Nelson Mandela, Rigoberta Menchu, Aung San Suu Kyi, Sojourner Truth, and Dorothy Day, and one solitary young man in Tiananmen Square. The great leaders of history have always been those who refused to barter their ideals for the sake of their personal gain and who rebelled against the lies of their times. If you want to be a real leader, if you want to give this country the new kind of leadership they're waiting for, you cannot live to get the approval of a system, any system. You must live to save the soul of it. As long as the world shall last, there will be wrongs, of course, Clarence Darrow warned us. And if no leaders object and no leaders rebel, those wrongs will last forever. If you really want to lead, you must rebel against the forces of death that are obstructing us from being fully human together. The purpose of life, the essayist Rostin writes, is not to be happy. The purpose of life is to matter, to have it make a difference that you lived at all. To save this age, use your education, use your freedom to make a difference in the way tomorrow's winds blow. Inspire in those who follow you the conviction and the will to denounce the lies, to reject the greed, to resist the heretics of inhumanity who peddle inequality, injustice, and the torturous instruments of social violence. To be a real leader, by all means, make a difference. Rebel, rebel, rebel. For all our sakes, rebel. For if the people will lead, eventually the leaders will follow. Oh, <laughs> 
April 12th, 2012, Stanford student Facebook status. So I'm walking between the library and Hoover Tower when Oprah flies by me on a golf cart with an armada of fans pursuing her on bike as her bodyguard is yelling into his wrist mic. Hashtag Stanford life. <laughs> In typical Stanford life fashion, I've had the privilege to meet extraordinary individuals on this campus over the past four years. But of all the people I've met, the most important person I've met is me. I've become closer to knowing who I am. By who I am, I mean what I care about. My values, priorities, beliefs, whether I can even articulate those values and how well I can live up to those beliefs. Our society increasingly obsesses over metrics or the idea of measuring quantifiable results of our actions. We measure percent gain in shareholding value, increase in student performance on standardized test scores, and net revenue per physician but in trumpeting results, we have sometimes forsaken the process. Business ethics have deteriorated. Some teachers have taught to the test. 
patient-physician relationships have strained. In emphasizing metrics, we equate achievement with scoring higher on the measurable things that we have identified, and we further reinforce these specified metrics. This is problematic for two reasons. One, we define results only as measurable things, and we neglect the immeasurable. And two, how do we know that we are measuring the right things? For most of us, throughout our lives, our metric of achievement has been grounded in what we do. What we do arguably granted us admission to Stanford, and it has been the focus of our attention since we were little. At age five, it was, what do you want to be when you grow up? And at age 22, it is that dreaded question, what are you going to do next year? Having an answer to these questions elicits oohs and ahs, as if having a plan for achievement is half the achievement. We are asked about the result that we want, but we are rarely asked to reflect upon the process. By process, I mean the question of who we want to be. Who do you want to be when you grow up? Who do you want to be next year? These are far more difficult questions to answer, and yet most of us spend less time thinking about them. In April of this year, Newark's mayor and our commencement speaker, Cory Booker, ran into a burning house and carried a neighbor through smoky stairwells and falling flames. Why were we so impressed with Mayor Booker's actions that we tweeted, hashtag Stanford commencement speaker, hashtag like a boss. <laughs> Were we drawn to the result of his dark night heroics? His achievement of saving someone's life? Or did we admire what his actions said about who he is, his ability to live up to his values of public service. Graduation marks a result. That coveted eight by 11 inch piece of paper will grant us another neat line of size 10 Times New Roman font to add to our resumes. But those pretty calligraphy letters do not reveal anything about the process. They do not say anything about the philosophical late night hallway conversations, the chicken tenders from Ax and Palm, or the saddening loss of two members from our community this year. Results are measurable, but not memorable. What is memorable is not measurable, and what is measurable is not memorable. Congratulations. Oh, 12! Oh, 12! Thank you. We invite you to rise for the benediction. There is a divine dream which the prophets and the rabbis have cherished and which fills our prayers and permeates the acts of true piety. It is a dream of a world rid of evil by the grace of God as well as by the efforts of people who are dedicated to the task of establishing the oneness of God in the world. The eternal
Eternal has not created the universe so that we might have opportunities to satisfy greed, envy, and ambition. We should not spend our lives hunting for trivial satisfactions while God is waiting for our efforts and devotion. We have not survived so that we might waste our years in vulgar vanities. God, God is, is waiting, waiting for, for us to, to redeem, redeem the, the world. world.
For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.